Can you can you hear? You have this microphone? That's awesome. <laughs> well, you'll be very comfortable with it then. Oh yeah. Miss Alton, is it? I don't know if she's if she's not with you. <laughs> is there is there a bell like at eight thirty like that we need to wait? Okay, that's what I was wondering. And then you can, and this works. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> anything wrong hello world <laughs> you know that like every time i'm talking to Good morning, how are you? <laughs> we're going to wait until the bell rings, but I'm going to clip you up and talk to you, okay? Is that all right? So we're just going to clip it on. You won't even see it. Is that okay? Feels all Perfect, right? yep. Okay. And then this is the clicker, and so it just is next to that way. Mm -hmm. Do I test it out? Yep. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you can go the wrong way. It's not a big deal. Yeah. There is a pointer on there. So this is. Good idea. Good idea. Good idea. Yeah. This is the pointer. Okay. So if you want to point at the screen, it probably needs to be head directly on. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> um, the most important thing I'm going to tell you about is breathe. Yeah. Breathe. Your brain needs oxygen, right? You can't function. So if you get up there and you can't know what to say. Just like a breath. Yep. Nobody notices it's pause and it takes a deep breath. Mm -hmm. Okay? And then so that's wherever you think because I don't know what your plan is. Yeah. So there's no right or wrong. Just share your story. Right? Mm -hmm. Are you proud of what you've done? I am. So then share that with okay. us. Okay. Right? That's the whole point of this. You've done the hard work. Got it. Now you just tell us. I did this really cool thing. Got it. Here's what I did. Yeah. Is that cool? Yeah. All right. And we're going to ask you to stand up. So here in between here and over there, it doesn't matter. It's that. And then that's just to kind of give you one shot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Are we ready to start? Or are we waiting? Okay. Do you want to start? Yeah. Right. Morning, everybody. Um, thank you for coming to our senior capstone presentation. Um, our first presenter is Nick Goring, and he focused on nuclear engineering in medical practice. Great way for us to start. Yep. Uh, welcome, Nick. Like she said, my topic is nuclear engineering medical practice by me. So about me, as you can see in those pictures, I do soccer and I do swim. I've done soccer varsity for three years, but done it throughout my life. And for swim, I did it all throughout high school. And this last season, I was team captain. So these, this passion for sports also extends into my jobs where I am a youth soccer referee for Parks and Rec, and I lifeguard at ACAC. So for topic, before I get to that, I'm going to address why there's a lifeguard logo on the right side. So this, I'm going to like preface this by saying this project was a roller coaster. It went up and down and up and down. Nothing went according to plan. Originally, I wanted to shadow an aerospace engineer, but Letting a high schooler observe you make missiles for the government just generally isn't the best idea. So I had to like scramble, find a new mentor. Originally, maybe like material science, that didn't work out. But one rainy day, I was lifeguarding, and literally, it was thunderstorming. And I had to get the people out of the pool. And one of the people, uh, his name was David Schlesinger, he was a lap swimmer. And we had a brief conversation that revealed he was the lead physician at the Gamma Knife Department of the UVA Hospital. And I found that pretty interesting. So I introduced myself. I said, hey, I'm Nick Goring. I introduced the Beer of Jest project. 
And he said he would love to do it. And a bunch of email threads later, I got my pass and I went down to UVA to start my internship. So while we were there, the, we worked on Gamma Knife SRR systems and their uses to treat patients. So what is a Gamma Knife? It's very complicated. I'm gonna briefly sum it up. If you wanna read like the whole 15 page paper we had to write about it, well me, uh, you can go to my website. But briefly, it is a machine that uses gamma radiation to treat neurological conditions, mainly tumors, but there are, were some cases where you can go in and they can like essentially zap out OCD or depression and you can just walk out as a new person. But it uses 192 of these things, which contain cobalt 60, which is a radioactive isotope of cobalt, and it goes in there, and they all collide at a central point to essentially eradicate the tumor. You can pass this around. <laughs> and so the patient is awake. Because it's like zapping your brain with radiation, you don't want to be moving that much. So there's a frame. And in other cases, there is a metal box that you can have bolted into your head. Yes, you're awake, which is why most people prefer the mask, less in, like, invasive. So my research question was, should a LINAC, a linear accelerator, or a gamma knife be used in modern hospitals? To sum it up, uh, bigger hospitals, like the UVA one, should have a gamma knife. It's specialized to treat issues in the brain because it's so precise and powerful. And the linear accelerator is just like an advanced x-ray. It works throughout the body. It's less precise, but it still gets the job done. So if you're a smaller hospital, you should have a LINAC. And if you're bigger, you should have a gamma knife. So for my professional learning experience, I mainly did observation. We did quality assurance tests, and we just made sure everything was working fine. So I don't know if the colors show up well on here, but there is a mask right there on like a dummy mannequin, just so you can like visualize what the mask does. It restrains them, but it's still comfy. So like some procedures are long, it can be two hours, which is why sometimes they have a movie screen above you while your brain's getting zapped, <laughs> just to like, just be more at ease. This is an ion chamber, and it just measures radiation amount. This is called a phantom, it mimics a brain, it mimics a brain. It has various like objects you can kind of search around for on that monitor. Once again, might not be able to see it, but there's the top and then there's the side. And you can just make sure everything's working properly. This is an example of a treatment plan. Once again, a tumor is abnormal. You're not going to have a, like a perfect sphere of a tumor. So you have to hit it with a bunch of different shots that are differently sized, different locations, different everything. So you can see multiple shots, and that's usually what a treatment plan looks like. That green lines, however, that's the fall off since the radiation spreads out. So there's always going to be a chance it hits an area that you don't want, which is why it's important just to make sure that the area is next to isn't vital. And because it's so powerful, that thing I passed around, wherever it is, if they didn't clean it 100%, you would all be dead but you're not, which means we can go to community service. <laughs> so for community service, once again, up and down. Originally, I wanted to do an awareness 5K. That didn't work out. But eventually, I had the idea to ask Laughing Dragon Kung Fu. When I was younger, I used to go there. But I had to stop due to school, sports. And they have this fundraiser called the Kickathon, where people can donate directly or the students have to kick a certain amount of kicks per minute and the people like family, friends can donate X amount of money for X amount of kicks. And because of COVID, it hasn't been going recently. So I emailed him just in case you forgot, I introduced myself. Then I said, introduce the project. And I said, I would love to start up. And he said, yeah, I would love to. We haven't done this in a while. It would be great. Originally, the money went to St. Jude's Children's Hospital. Since it hasn't been started and I reached out, it, the money is now going to a UVA affiliated website that I designed. And it hasn't happened yet. Once again, like the roller coaster this project was, uh, he had to get a spontaneous surgery. So that will happen April 20th. If you want to see how that turns out, go to the expo. But there will be performances. I'll be helping out. I'll be making the flyers. 
I'll just be generally just helping out, making sure it goes according to plan. So my mentor, mentor David Schlesinger, was an electrical engineer, and then he got a PhD and found his calling in uh, gamma radiation. He works for the UVA hospital. And for community service, my mentor was Sifu Chris Goodbar. Let me tell you, he has not aged a day since I went there when I was younger. He uh, went to, I believe it's called the Jiao Ga Shaolin Institute of Herdon, and he owns the school. So when I reached out to him, we were able to do the project. Significance. So with my community service, I was reviving a local like event just to spread awareness about the topic, which was the UVA, like cancer for neurological issues. And also the money would be spent, it would be for like people that were in financial issues, they couldn't necessarily afford the treatment. Advice, what would I have done if I could have done the project differently? Everything, the entire project I would have done differently. It's don't get me wrong, it was amazing. I learned a lot, it was fun, it was interesting. It's just that it was stressful. I never knew what was gonna work and what wasn't. So my advice to a new BRVJ student thinking about the project, do it early and plan. Plan how you're gonna manage your time. And if you're going to the UVA building that I went to, plan how you're gonna get to that building because parking was a nightmare. Just do it early. I know you could have done it in the summer. If I did that, I definitely would have been less stressed. So big two, be early and plan. So my future plans, right now I'm undecided on what college I want to go to. I do know it wants to be like a related engineering field. I'm, right now I'm leaning towards area space engineering. And a short-term future plan is to hopefully get a good grade on this project. But <laughs> any questions? Like why it's used for the thing. Okay, so this is a long process. Hopefully I can get like the less boring part of it. But so cobalt 60 is an isotope of cobalt 59. You're a chemist, like you get the gist. But it undergoes beta minus decay. So it sheds an antineutrino and gamma radiation and like grounds itself to nickel. So because gamma radiation is the most powerful radiation pretty much, it's so precise and it's really great for medical treatment. Yep. <laughs> so which part of the brain would you target with this? You mentioned the treatment you gave, I think OCD, and there's another example you gave? Depression. depression. But those were like very small cases. Okay. Most of the time it is like for tumors that are harmful to the brain or could have the potential to develop harmful aspects. Okay, so does it like induce cell death? Yeah, so the cells that it targets undergo apoptosis. It's like the tumors. <laughs> the tumors will just like exp undergo cell death and stop existing. You do have to come back a couple times if it's like a really if it spreads fast and grows a lot though. Anyone else? Okay. Well, thank you. <laughs> Just read. <laughs> Okay. 
I'm good. And then what I'm pulling over to my this one and that one over there. And then just reaching the audio up because I don't have to. Okay. <laughs> we have about two minutes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's cool. How does he work? Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's the goal. How long has he worked there? He's a man. Oh, yeah. Oh, he's been there for like 18, 20 years. Yeah, he's been there for a while. <laughs> well, if I get there fast enough and he doesn't retire earlier, then I can fly with him if I work there. So that's what I want to do. Yeah. I can be like, can I fly with him for your time? And they usually do that. Yeah. Because it would be less stressful. Yeah. Because <laughs> if you get to fly, I know you fly for free, but do you have to flow when he's like retired? Yes, I have. That was interesting. Yeah. That was fun. I like, what does he like to talk about you? I'm like, so like, No, but it was interesting hearing him talk over the intercom. I know him. Oh my gosh. Yeah. 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 yeah, it was pretty cool. Yes and no, because I have I have a brother and both my parents. When we travel, we would travel together, and it's hard to get four seats or three seats if it's just my dad's work. Yeah. <laughs> I know that. Yeah, that's the goal for college. <laughs> Do a bunch of traveling. I don't know. I don't want to go overseas. I think that would be cool. But no, they don't. Yes, I love to go to fly. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yes. <laughs> Thank you. All right. All right, everybody. Um, our second presenter is Annika Burnside, and she focused on the life and experiences of an airline pilot. Annika. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Ms. Johnson, for that introduction. And as she said, my topic was the life of an airline pilot, or to put it in simple terms, aviation. So a little bit about me. I am the class president of 2024, and I participate in SEA and Beta Club. I also run varsity track and cross country from fall to spring. And I like to spend a majority of my time outdoors, and if I can be, flying, obviously. <laughs> Um, why I chose this topic. So aviation has been a part of my life since I was a baby. Um, both my parents were pilots and that's how they met. And my dad is still a pilot at Southwest Airlines. Because of that, my life has completely revolved around his schedule, my parents' schedule. My parents both know a lot about the topic, so they talk about it all the time. So I've just kind of picked it up throughout the years. I would say at first, I kind of ignored that I liked aviation because I didn't want to be one of those kids who just did what their parents did. But I eventually realized that this is definitely what I was passionate about. So that's why I chose to do this for my project. For my research question, I chose to research how does aviation psychology affect pilots in training and throughout their careers? I originally chose to do psychology because I participated in a class that was through BRBGS um, Virginia, Air, Virginia Aerospace Science and Technology Scholars. Through this program, I had the opportunity to go to NASA over the summer, and while I was there, I helped a bunch of different kids and a bunch of different groups plan a project or a trip to Mars. So my job was to be the psychologist, 
and I was supposed to locate or learn any psychological problems that could affect the astronauts in the mission. So I had to figure out what they need mentally through transit or living on Mars. And I learned that I really, really enjoyed learning about the psychological aspect. And I was really happy that I didn't get stuck um, like figuring out the fuel for the rocket. Like that's not my forte. So the psychology definitely, I had fun doing that. So I decided to insert that into my project because I can use this for my own benefit if I learn how to get through my training or my career psychologically, it could help me and benefit me. Um, I interviewed a man named Chase Tressel for my um, professional interview. And he is a manager of a corporate airline in Shenandoah. And he's a pilot today and he flies Challenger 300s. If you don't know what that is, it's a private jet. And so I talked to him about what he did throughout his training and his career and what he would have done differently or what he thought helped him the best throughout his training. And I learned that the biggest problem um, psychologically is fatigue. So that's a huge deal throughout training and your career. And also you need to be prepared. <laughs> Make sure you know what you're doing before every flight. Make sure you're prepared and ready to be in the air. And especially in your career when you're in charge of hundreds of people's lives, you know what you're doing and you're ready to fly them. For my internship, I had the opportunity to go to Averett University to fly Piper TXs. I originally found this program with the help of the guidance counselors here at Madison and they showed me this program at the end of my junior year and I decided I wanted to apply and see if I could go fly. And thank goodness I got in because I don't know what I would have done if I didn't. So I went there for about two weeks and I had the opportunity to fly each morning in the airplanes and this is the airplane that I flew every day. Um, I worked with a CFI or a certified flight instructor and a ground school instructor every day and they taught me what I need to, know, know, need to know in the airplanes. While I was there, I spent, I think, about a total of like 10 days flying. Um, we woke up every morning and went for two hours to the airport. So there were two different groups. There were about 10 of us there and five would go early in the morning and five would go about 10. So this is one of the pictures that I took at about like seven o'clock in the morning when we got there. And I would work with my certified flight instructor to, for about two hours in the morning, and then we would go back, eat lunch, and then I would work with my ground, ground instructor. My mentor was Jacob Marshall, as pictured here, and he was my CFI. I originally emailed the lady who ran the program, but I realized very quickly that I never saw her there. She was only there for like the ceremony at the end, and I never really interacted with her at all. So I changed my mentor to Jacob because he worked with me every day that I was there. And he was the one who taught me what to do in the air and on the ground. After we were done flying and tied the airplane up, we'd go into the hangar and what did we do today? Log my flight hours. And he would explain to me what I could do better, what was good. And like he helped me with all my landings to the point where I could land the airplane by myself. For my quote, I chose, when once you have tasted flight, you will forever walk the earth with your eyes turned skyward, for there you have been and there you will always long to return, by Leonardo da Vinci. And I chose this quote for my entire project because I felt like it really resonated with how I felt after my internship. Um, after I really felt the life of an airline pilot of flying every day and waking up and getting to land the airplane, I wanted to keep doing it. Like I didn't want to leave. I was loving what I was doing and I really 100% knew that this is the career I wanted to take. So I felt like this quote really just resonated with my entire project and how I felt throughout. For my community service, I worked at the local elementary school um, with the STEM teacher there and I wanted to share my passion for my topic with younger kids because I feel like here in Madison County, not very many kids know what the possibilities are. It's a very small county and there's not a ton of things to go do. So I wanted to share at a younger age that you can fly airplanes. So I went into six different fifth grade classes and I gave a short presentation about what aviation was, what I had the opportunity to do over the summer, 
And then I had a little fun with them and let them play with paper airplanes afterward and taught them different ways to fold it to make them fly further and what they can do to make them go faster, all those different things, just to really inspire them about aviation and hope that they would pursue it in their future and be just as passionate about it as I am. For the data that I collected, this was a little challenging and I really had to work with my mentor for my community service um, to figure this out because you can't really just hand a bunch of fifth graders a computer and say fill out a Google form about how you felt about my presentation. So I worked with her and she said they really understand smiley faces and frowny faces. So I made a worksheet and printed it out for all the kids and had them fill it out before and after. So this is an example of one of the 8 million worksheets I had to look at. And um, I had them fill out and answer the questions about how they felt before and after. So before you can see this kid felt he didn't really know what aviation was and he doesn't know anything about it. And he is interested in it. He doesn't know what it is, but he's interested to learn more. And then I had him fill it out after my presentation, after the paper airplanes, and he showed me, now he knows what it is, now he knows a little bit about it, and he's still interested in it. So for my data, um, I took all the worksheets and put it into a sheet and made pie charts here. So you can see that this is all the different questions, the three different questions, and the red is no, or the frowny faces, and the blue is the smiley faces. So you can see the blue went so much, like went up a significant amount after my presentation, which made me feel so much better <laughs> after I gave my presentation because I really, imp the impact that I wanted to give was there. And um, the kids liked it so much and that the teacher there was surprised by the outcome that she asked me to zoom in in years to come to talk to them again because some of the kids who never pay attention in the class were paying attention. So she felt like it was very beneficial for everyone there. For my personal reflection, I absolutely 100% enjoyed this project and I would have never said that before I started. I walked into this project thinking, oh, this is just a ton of extra work that I'm going to have to do with my other classes and I wasn't that excited for it. But I loved everything that I did and I learned a ton, especially through my research and my internship. And I really enjoyed sharing my passion with the younger kids through my community service. For my advice, the first thing, biggest thing I would say is do your internship early. I didn't realize that I was going to use Pathways as my internship. And I found it at the beginning of junior year and realized that I could use it for my internship over the summer. And that helped me out a whole bunch because I had that out of the way. And if I decided I didn't like it, I still had time to do something else if I really wanted to. So because I got that done early, the research paper and community service was a lot easier to just figure out and I had more time to get that done. Second, communication. I would have never gotten anything done or figured out if I didn't communicate with my mentors or my teachers, um, especially my community service. I did a lot of meetings in person. I did a lot of emailing just to figure it out and make sure I could get to the classes and make sure everything was gonna work. And lastly, just as big as the internship, Make sure you love your topic. If you don't love your topic, it's going to be a ton of work that you have to just get through. But because I loved what I was doing, it didn't feel like work, and I loved learning more about what my topic was. So then I ultimately had fun throughout the entire thing because I was learning about what will benefit me and help me in my future. For my future plans, I plan on going to Middle Tennessee State University and to do their aerospace professional pilot program. While I'm there, I'm planning to get all my ratings with their Diamond aircraft, as pictured here, and then to become a professional pilot and hopefully work with one of their partner programs at Southwest or Delta and become a major airline pilot at one of those two airlines. Any questions? Yes. Uh, end of junior year, sorry. <laughs> Uh, like I said, the guidance counselor um, brought it to my attention. It was connected with this, like the same people ran it that ran my um, program with NASA that I did through BRVGS, which I think all of you guys had the option to take that class. Um, because of that, I think that's part of why I got in. It was really, really competitive. But they showed me the program, and I was like, oh, that actually looks really cool, and I want to be a pilot. So I applied for it, and then 
thank goodness, got in. So <laughs> that's how I decided that that's what I was going to do. It was kind of just a, it just happened. I didn't really plan for it. Um, I would say there was a big response from everyone. Um, they were little kids, so I got a lot of questions about, which really surprised me. I got a lot of questions about the danger of flying. Like a lot of them, were like, well, what happens if the wings fall off? And I was like, um, that doesn't normally happen. So I think a lot of it is fear of flying. So after I explained that it's safer than driving, which none of them believed me, um, they were all very, very excited about it. And then they all asked me for things. Can I do something now? Can I fly now? And I was like, you can go to an intro flight and have a CFI like fly you around and see if you like it. And they were all very excited about it. Any other questions? Yeah? If you had done an apology of Mm -hmm. Like you mentioned exhaustion, is there anything else that's kind of unique to, I guess, this very kind of world globe trotting lifestyle that's just an interesting <laughs> thing you came across, or what, what really stuck out with that? Um, in my interview with uh, Chase, he said that his biggest thing was studying, um, which was a big, it was an interesting thing for me because. He said you walk into a new airline job to fly like the Challenger or a 737 and you expect to just have someone teach you the information but he said you really have to take your time to learn the different parts of the airplane because they expect you to come in prepared. Um, so you have to kind of already know what you're doing in the airplane before you hop in the simulator with the person who's going to teach you like emergency scenarios. So he said that was the thing that put him the most behind. So I would say the two, like another big thing is just being prepared and know what you're doing and making sure you're ready psychologically and in every way for whatever you're about to do. <laughs> yeah, like like your car manual, he was like, you want to know the whole manual before you walk in. You don't want to walk in and have someone expect you to tell you what that button does. You want to know what everything already does. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, everybody. Um, our third presenter is Eric Roth, and Eric focused on the ways that linguistics um, affects culture. Eric.
So like Ms. Johnson was saying, uh, my topic is on linguistics and culture and uh, why we speak the way we do. So about me, I uh, I'm a family man. I love my family. I love being with my friends. Uh, another big thing is I lo absolutely love music. Uh, I have a bass guitar at home that I practice uh, every day. I even I love supporting local musicians, local music scenes. I love going out, uh, looking at live performances and music. And I also just, uh, I love watching movies. So why this topic? So this goes back really far back. When I was younger, I, I grew up in a household that, was, that only spoke Spanish. I grew up speaking only Spanish. Uh, my main way of learning English when I was younger was through watching cartoons. And when I, went, uh, when I integrated into public schools, I started integrating more into American culture. And through this American culture, I, I kind of started forgetting my own culture, my own uh, Bolivian roots. And I started pushing this away. I would avoid speaking Spanish at all costs. I absolutely would not speak Spanish unless I had to. And, but somewhere throughout middle school, I kind of got a curiosity for why. Like, why do I speak two languages? Why can I do this? Why do I have these cultural views? different from everyone else's. So I just rekindled a flame. I, I wondered why I had two personalities. It really does feel like you have two personalities. And I really wanted to learn more about this. So this is my, uh, this is my mentor, Mark Sicoli. He's a part of the Department of Anthropology at UVA. He's also the head of the linguistics program. With this mentor, I had multiple meetings. Uh, and I talked about. <laughs> And we had multiple meetings about linguistics, obviously. And his uh, field of research is mainly, through, uh, is mainly the documentation of, of indigenous tribes. He documents these tribes through cultural context instead of just writing it down. This is important because cultural context, if you just write down translations in 100 years from now, no one's going to know why they speak the way they do, why they do the things they do. So cultural context is very important. My internship. Through my mentor, I was able to have connections through two professors at UVA. My per the first professor was Professor Crabtree. She let me sit in in her classes. And I feel like I learned a lot from her classes, but the the main experience I had was this group right here of uh, people in the class. They kind of took me in. They taught me what it is, like linguistics. And they even trained me for this big competition that we had near the end. Uh, this competition was a linguistics-based competition. And my training mainly consisted of linguistic problem sets where I was given samples of languages that I did not know, of course. And I had to interpret the uh, grammatical syntax and the morphology of the sentences and create new sentences based off that. And at the, at the competition, I was very excited. because I, I really love this topic. At the competition, there were two different uh, competitions, of course. Uh, the first one was a solo where I did problem sets similar to those that I trained with my group here. And actually, coincidentally, I met another BRVGS student doing the same topic, which I thought was very interesting because this is, I thought I was going to be the first one to do this topic. I, I looked back throughout, and no one really did linguistics. And we actually shared, we shared the same mentor as well. And back to the competition, the second competition was in I think it was a 45 minute span, I had to translate the Armenian constitution with a group. And that was really fun. That was probably the best part of the competition. Uh, and for the second part of my internship, I, this professor Dobrin, it was more of a traditional class though. I just went in and she would teach me different linguistic, you know, stuff about linguistics. Uh, I feel like I really learned a lot from this internship. It really taught me what it was like from the perspective of a college student. 
and what it's like to traverse the college campus and just be part of that lifestyle. So research. I research the the connection between linguistics and culture and how it affects worldview and your perception. And I actually found out, or my big question was, does language define your, uh, your perception on the world? I actually found out, no, it doesn't. But it's a lot more complicated than that. Uh, the, language you, the language itself does not influence your, your perception, but it does, however, it is, uh, language is, is actually more of a reflection of thought than it is the other way around, as I originally thought. So I found that no. You're, the language you speak, the culture you have, does not influence your cognitive abilities. It instead is the other way around. So for my community service, I actually did this here. This I did a, a presentation here, and I worked with a Madison County High School College Advisor, Ms. Rhodes. And with Ms. Rhodes, we gathered information on why, why students of marginalized communities go to uh, seek uh, further education less than the majority. Well, so, we made a presentation kind of highlighting why this is and why multiculturalism is important in our daily lives and just everywhere really on diversity. Uh, my reflection. So throughout this whole journey, I felt like I learned a ton. I really loved working with my mentor. This is a very personal topic and I I just felt like I learned more than I would have in normal projects. You know, this is a project where we were given freedom to do anything we'd like and I really took advantage of that freedom and I really enjoyed it. And for the advice, my advice is number one is to plan ahead. Always plan. I was never really good at planning, so I need this project really helped me work on it, but that is the number one thing. And then uh, number two is do something that you love doing. You know, you have the freedom to explore anything you like, so why not just do something you love doing? If you go the easy route and do something simple and easy just because, then you're kind of missing out the point of this project. My future plans, I am not decided on where I want to go yet, but I am hoping to uh, major in computer engineering and a minor in anthropology for two years at a school, and I hope to transfer to UVA to finish my bachelor's degree. Questions? Yes. Um. Actually, yes. Uh, you see that the the constitution is is was very different to ours. It was kind of eye opening to see what they believe in compared to what we believe in. Yes. The research question was affects uh, the person. Language on their culture. On language and culture on perception. Language and culture on perception. Mm -hmm. And then I remember you saying that you kind of dug into this question and found a lot of interesting things. And, and mm -hmm. if I remember correctly, please correct me if I'm wrong, it doesn't affect it directly, but dot, 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 if I'm correct, you bring that distinction. Right? It, it influences something. It influences. Mm -hmm. So what was, what was maybe a little bit more that you found influencing? Where did language kind of in this of worms you kind of found and started mm -hmm. digging into. So the the main thing I researched was the Sapir Whorf hypothesis, if okay. I'm saying that correctly. It is basically the theory that uh, the language you speak 
it directly defines what you can perceive as a person. And researching that, I found that it is not true. Uh, your cognitive abilities actually influence your language you speak. So it is the other way around. But they both kind of influence each other. So I don't know if that answers yeah, yeah. your question. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but I was wondering if there's a project that helps you kind of like Actually, uh, no, I, I'd like to keep them separate. <laughs> it's, it's like, um, like a completely different person. Uh, it, it's very complicated, the, the workings, but uh, yeah, it, it just, it's just like a completely different person. I'd like to keep it separate. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Any, is that it? Any more questions? So good morning, just like Ms. Johnson said, I'm Annie Herman and this is my presentation on the importance of outreach. So a little bit about me and who I am. Um, growing up, I watched two of my older brothers participate in governor's school, so obviously keeping the sibling rivalry alive, I had to one-up them, so I also had to get into governor's school. So I'm beyond thankful for this opportunity to be here and just share about something that I'm passionate about. Um, aside from governor's school, I'm involved in SCA, FCA, class officers, and beta club president. Um, I also participate in three varsity sports. This year I chose golf, soccer, and basketball. But outside of school and all the school spirit, um, I'm really involved in my church community, so I love going to youth group, Bible studies, and helping out with the youth ministry when I can. It's been a part of my life forever, so continue on with that. So this was my quote of quality for my entire presentation. It's one of my favorite verses. It's 1 Timothy 4.12. It says, Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in faith, in love, and purity. So I think this is a great verse for not only me, but I believe for everyone. Because we are in a vulnerable stage of our life, we are still considered children, but we have big decisions to make. 
But instead of letting our youth set us back, I think we should really dig in and just, we are willing to learn, we are ready to learn. So I think we should use our youth as an opportunity to grow. So why did I choose this topic? This past summer, I had the opportunity to go on a mission trip to the Dominican Republic to an area called San Marcos. Um, I went over there with 20 of my best friends and people that I didn't really know, but I now consider them my family. We spent time in the local village, um, setting up a summer camp for the kids, essentially in the mornings, playing games, communicating the best we could. I learned I should have taken some Spanish classes in high school, but that's all long gone now. But um, in the afternoon, we just basically helped around the church. If there was renovations that needed to be done, we painted part of the building. Um, we also walked around in the community, got to share our testimony, hear some of theirs, hand out goodies, rice, anything of that nature. And really, I had no expectations going into this trip about how it would change me. I was just hoping to help out some. But really, I grew in my faith more than I could ever imagine. So I was beyond thankful for the opportunity. And going into senior year, I knew I wanted to major what I wanted to major in in college. So I wanted to use my last opportunity to learn and share about anything I wanted. So I decided on the importance of outreach. So here's my lovely internship team. I got to shadow the Victory 127 team that's run through Mountain View Chapel here in Madison County. They um, open up the opportunity for sponsorship for children in Kampala, Uganda. Uh, I believe it's $35 a month to sponsor a child and this money goes towards their food, education, things of that sort. Um, outside of sponsoring children, if you can't fund that, there's also larger donation funds such as construction, food, education, paying for the teachers, things like that. More specifically, I got to shadow Miss Jan Crofthamel. Um, I helped her some in the Christmas celebration. So they had a goal of raising $30,000 and they surpassed it, which is amazing, especially in a county like Madison. It's very tiny, so I didn't expect it, but prayers were answered. Uh, this money fed over, I believe, 1,000 families, which is crazy. Um, they also reached out to the elderly and local law enforcement because their jobs are dangerous. They don't have the best housing situation, so they wanted to reach out to them. And they also were able to give every uh, sponsored child through Victory 127 a Christmas. So that includes gifts and treats, things like that. Uh, I come from a pretty large family, so but I never had to worry about where my food was going to come from next. And Christmas really isn't a need, but it was always there. So it was always an opportunity. So I'm just beyond thankful to have seen such a change in these kids' lives. Um, outside of the Christmas operation, I also got to watch her upload sponsorship cards onto the website, the Victory 127 website. So every kid that comes through that needs to be sponsored, um, a little bit of information is put on the website about them. So people can learn about them. You can write letters. There should be a connection between it. It's not You're just not sending money over there and wondering where it's going. No, you are actually forming a bond with these children. I also rolled a lot of coins. So there is a rice and beans fund. And you can donate online. But you can. there's also a jar in church where you could throw some change in, any spare change in your car, in your pocket that you want to get rid of. Put it in that jar. And if you threw it in that jar while I was working with Miss Jan, I probably rolled it. But this time did not go to waste. Obviously, the money was for a great cause. But I also had the, I also had great conversation with her. She helped me with not only this project, but gave me, gave me great advice for life. And she's a great role model that I'll forever have. So here are my mentors. She was my community service and internship mentor. And then on the other side, you'll see Mr. Tim Duggins. And he was my expert interview. So I interviewed him. In the midst of my research paper, I really hadn't narrowed down my topic yet. So I just asked him a few questions about outreach, the impact of it, different approaches, if there was a difference between local and global. I was really just trying to get my head on straight. So I was thankful for the opportunity to talk to him. And he gave me great advice. But one of the main things that stuck out to me that I used throughout my entire research was intentional connections. If you are not intentional with it, it will not be successful. So on to my research. Here is a I quoted him, if he doesn't mind. Uh, it says, I'm an absolute believer that the heart of healing others is relationship driven. Lasting impact is accomplished through relationships. So in, initially, I wanted to talk about the differences in impact between local <laughs> and global outreach. But then I realized impact is impact. A difference is a difference made. There is no differences between them. So I just focused on impact as a whole. So um, through my research, I found I found evidence that supported, supported his comment about intentional connections, and I proved that intentional connections are the only way to successful outreach. 
So for my community service, I was able to offer a gift wrapping service during our school's winter wonderland. So while the kids were getting their face painted, playing games, taking pictures of Santa, I was in Santa's workshop um, working away with my mom. And so the holiday season is a stressful time, but it really shouldn't be. It should be a time about family, things of that nature. So I wanted to take some weight off of people's backs. So if they wanted to drop off their gifts, they were willing, they were able to. And if they wanted to sit and have a conversation with me, that was great. If they wanted to leave, that was fine too. I just let them know when their gifts were ready and they could come back and pick it up. So I was not making a donation mandatory by any means, but if they wanted to donate, I was accepting monetary donations and this money is going towards Victory 127. I raised about $300 in cash. Uh, obviously, they helped me so much throughout my presentation, so I wanted to give a little bit back. And then I was also accepting personal sanitary items. So I recently had the opportunity to hear a missionary speak, and she said something that really stuck out to me. And she said, if you're not make, willing to make a difference right where you are, what makes you think you're going to go halfway across the world to make a difference? So these personal sanitary items will be going to Mesa because they are a local organization here in Madison County that helps out with surrounding areas. I wanted to take the initial step to make a difference here. So for my legacy, um, I just wanted to encourage others to reach out to make a difference. Um, outreach is essentially our projects, every single one of our projects. We had a task at hand, we had a spark of an idea, we found someone with a mutual connection, we formed that bond, gained knowledge from them, hopefully left our own piece of nugget behind for them. So every single one of our projects is essentially outreach driven. So I just wanted to encourage others to continue to reach out, continue to have a conversation, and maybe next time think a little more deeply about it. So for my personal review, I've, thought, I've mentioned it throughout my entire pre presentation, basically. It started before my project even began. Going over to the Dominican Republic, I grew in my faith, and that was the first step. But I just hope to continue to carry it all over to, into college, and I've grown as a person more than I could ever imagine. And 10 out of 10 recommend this project. It was a great learning experience. So for my future plans, I will either be attending Liberty University or the University of Virginia to pursue a degree in nursing. I've taken several CNA classes throughout high school. It's something that I'm very passionate about. I find it fascinating, so I'm just beyond thankful. For this opportunity to go on to college, and I can't wait to see where the future takes me. So my advice for future students, I encourage you all to be patient, not only with yourself, but others. Sometimes that is hard, but... Um, Stop trying to look at the big picture. It's one step at a time. You'll do great. You'll mess up. Things won't go as planned. It'll all be fine. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, it really just depends where I am with my life at that moment. I've considered travel nursing, but I haven't decided yet. S still hoping that that will be answered later in life. <laughs> yes. Um, not necessarily for this project, but last summer I had the opportunity to do a Martha Jefferson internship program, so I got to go shadow some nurses on the med surge floor at Martha Jefferson but not specifically for this project. It was definitely an obstacle, I will say that. It, it took some getting used to, but I really think that we had a connection that was there before just because we had a mutual interest, and I think that works for anyone. And just like Eric was talking about before, Language, it does make you kind of two separate people, but it doesn't change the way that you perceive things necessarily.
Okay, so that's still just pushing it that way. That's how I know so this is how long. So you're pointing with your fingers probably better than that. So I'm going to give that to you. Let's do it on your tie or on your um, tie? Tie works. On your tie. Does that feel okay? Yeah, it's fine. Just remember to breathe. Okay, I'm going to talk oxygen, right? You're beautiful and you can't remember what to say. Nobody notices. I just took a deep breath. This process. Okay? Now give your brain a little extra oxygen. Put you back on track. Okay? okay. And again, I don't know what you're planning to say, so it doesn't really matter right. if you start where you wanted to start. Just right. look at the picture and see what you, what you want to talk about. Okay. Are you proud of what you've done? Yeah, I'll say so. Cheers. <laughs> like, this is something you've been waiting for. This is your chance to tell people about what you're doing. Okay. Uh, so, you're asking me to go in between the two lines. Okay. Takes, and then facing the audience between right. the lines. Gotcha. Yes, ma'am. Do you have any questions for me? Uh, I don't think so. Okay, just keep breathing. Okay. okay. <coughs> All right, next up we have um, Evan Rosado. And Evan took his passion for history and his passion for film and built his, his senior project around those two. Evan. So hi everyone, my name is Evan Rosado and I did my project on depicting American history through film. So a little bit about me, I, um, I participate in a few extracurricular activities here at Madison County High School. Um, throughout my years here, I've participated in basketball, I've ran track, and I am on, a member of Beta Club. Uh, I like doing outdoorsy things, so here's a picture of me at Harper's Ferry. I went on a hike with my friends a few months ago, and I just like being outside and enjoying nature, and I want to get into fishing this summer. <laughs> so a lot of outdoorsy things I like. So why this topic? Uh, as Ms. Johnson said, I have always been, uh, I've always loved history. I've always been, I guess what you can say, a history buff. Uh, ever since I was young, I've been particularly interested in military history, you know, World War II, World War I, the average, you know, young guy in Civil War, all these things. So, and I also have been uh, recently, more recently, interested in film. So um, when I was brainstorming topics for this project, I thought I like film, I like history, so why not combine the two? And that was my topic, depicting American history through film. So this is my mentor, Ms. Dorinda Hartman. She works at the Library of Congress. Uh, she works in the research department, and she actually works specifically with um, the film, the paper print film that was made in the early 1900s. And I was able to work with her to see everything that she does to preserve the film and to put it on display so that uh, people can come in and see it. But I'll talk more about that later when we get into the internship. This is Ms. Holly Robertson. She works at UVA in the Department of uh, ex ex Exhibits and Curation. She actually puts on displays for the UVA library. She, um, when I actually, we actually went there for the governor's school, um, one of the mixer things that we did, or the, uh, for the research actually, and I was able to see one of the exhibits that she helped create, and that kind of inspired this idea. And so I actually did her for my expert interview, and we talked a lot about what she does at UVA and how she puts on the displays and what all goes into that. And we also talked about um, why her job is so important and it helped a lot with my research because I was able to talk to her about um, why exactly this is such an important thing and why it's important to preserve history. 
So this is my internship. Um, I did it at the Library of Congress in D.C. at the Madison campus, mostly the Madison campus, which is the, I guess you say, the less aesthetic um, building. Uh, here is a picture of the, uh, where they actually display the paper print film. So what they do is they take the, the film, the paper print film from the early 1900s and, and so forth, and they would put it in here for students to come see because for example, when I was there, a student came in and actually asked for a film of Los Angeles in the 1950s. And so Mr. Hartman was actually able to go to the back where they store all the films, and she was able to find all the, the films she has of Los Angeles in the 1950s and was able to show them so they could write their, um, they could write a paper about it. And they would use that information to, for, for their academic pursuits. Here's me just standing in front of the Library of Congress Madison building, and here's actually a paper print film that it's beyond preservation kind of that's kind of the best they could do with it it's not able to be displayed but they still have it and it's cool so I thought that was interesting um, here is the room where Miss Hartman at would actually display the film this is where she would work uh, in front of this there would be a screen and they actually had live events where they would invite people to come in and watch old film from the early 1900s and she would back, be back here actually cranking and operating the film so that it could be displayed for the people this picture here is from the uh, Jefferson Building. This is actually Thomas Jefferson's library. This is the more like pretty side of the Library of Congress, which this isn't technically where I did the research and part of my internship, but um, this is where, I guess you could say, the, the arts and the, the actual uh, historical artifacts and things are kept. This is another picture of the Library of Congress Jefferson Building. Um, I just thought it was a really cool picture to add because I think, I think the architecture there is just stunning. It's pretty beautiful. So I actually learned, and overall the internship I learned a lot from because it was interesting to see because I talked to Ms. Hartman about uh, exactly like what she does and how she preserves history every day with her job. She goes in and she cleans the film so that can be displayed for people. She keeps it in these like canisters so that it, it gives it kind of a skeleton and she just works to make sure that that is kept alive, make sure that the film and stuff from back then is kept uh, alive so people can still enjoy it and look at it. So for my community service, I actually worked with a couple of the teachers here at Madison County High School, uh, specifically Miss uh, Weekly, who is a U.S. history teacher, and also Miss Strong, who teaches, I believe, world history. And so I asked them what I asked them because I wanted to create a video following the theme of film and history. So I wanted to create a video um, about history, and I asked them what topic I should do that on or what topic they would like me to do that on. And they said reconstruction because that's the topic they were going into next when I asked. And so I created a video, around eight minute video on reconstruction, and I gave it to them, I emailed it to them, and they're using them for their class to help teach the class about reconstruction. So that was pretty cool, I was able to do that. For research, uh, my research topic was mainly around why preserving history is so important and how it basically ties a society together. And what I found that was when a society tends to they don't preserve their history, they forget it, or they ignore it. I found that they tend to fall apart, and this is seen, perhaps the most um, popular example of this was the Roman Empire around in 476 AD when they fell. Uh, they basically just lost faith in, their, faith in their institutions and their old way of life and their history, and so that helped, well, that didn't help them, that uh, stimulated their fall. So that was mainly my research. Um, reflection, I would say I, I actually enjoyed this project because it kind of forces you to do something that like you wouldn't do outside of this project. You wouldn't you wouldn't think to do something like this because it's just obviously you think it's a lot of work, but I, I promise it's good for you. So be your VGS juniors, you'll you'll find that it's good for you. Advice, um, I would say number one my number one piece of advice would be to use your resources. Uh, Ms. Johnson's here to help you. If you ask her, I promise you she will she will aid you. Um, also, choose something you're interested in. I know this has been said, but I can't stress this enough because if you choose something you're interested in, you're going to be spending a lot of time in it. So choose something, number one, you want to learn about, and number two, that you're interested in because you're going to be spending so much time. You're basically going to be living, breathing, and sleeping this project for a few months. So definitely choose something that you want to do. And number three, I would say uh, persevere because Early on in this project, uh, it was around October, I did not have a internship and it was getting close to the deadline where I needed to have an internship and I had been rejected originally by the Library of Congress. They said that they were not gonna be able to allow me to, um, 
to intern there, basically because they there's just no precedent for it, they said. But uh, I stuck with it. I found some other places, but eventually they emailed me back and they said that they could. So I would say don't lose faith. Always you know, keep trying because I promise you it'll work out in the end. So if something doesn't go the way that you intend it to go, like don't stress out over that because it'll all work out. I promise it'll all work out. Uh, future plans. I plan on uh, attending either the University of uh, Pittsburgh or James Madison University, and I want to study computer science uh, with a minor in finance. Uh, have yet not, not yet decided where I'd like to go, but I know I want to study computer science. And uh, question. Yes. So that's actually a really good question, and I think that, well, it's okay, when I was there, uh, the whole digital archive thing, those are actually taken from the original, um, like the paper print film. They would display it, and they would take that off of the screens that I showed you, and they would actually put that into an archive. So I think for, for digital storage, you kind of need to have that physical aspect there so that it can be moved to the digital, like the computer. So I think, yeah, that's, I hope that answers your question. Most of them are already stored digitally. Right, yeah, that's true too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, for my video, it was uh, kind of stressful actually because I am not really good at this type of stuff. Like, I've watched movies, I like film, but I've never actually made anything close to that, or let alone a YouTube video or anything like that. So, uh, the hardest part for me was actually like getting the, the basically the footage and stuff or the, the pictures that needed to be in the video and also matching that up with my voice was something that like was so tedious and it took me a while to do and that's actually where the majority of my time was spent was matching my voice with the video and also recording my voice too was pretty hard because I messed up probably hundreds of times and I had to go back delete things and fix it and you know, it was just it was a pretty tedious pro process but I'm pretty happy with the way it turned out. I would hope so because that was my goal in creating the video and I wanted to, I kind of wanted to like, I feel like coming from a student who's like interested in this stuff because I feel like when a student hears their teacher like just talking about it for hours on end, I feel like they're not really inspired by like, they don't think it's interesting, I guess. So I kind of wanted, my goal for this was, I kind of wanted to inspire them by like, hearing it from a student kind of. So I hope that, um, I hope that provoked their, their interest in it a little more. I don't know, I'll probably fall asleep during it. <laughs> during it. I'm just going to find out. Alright, we're going to move over here. Um, so this is just next and back, just regular. This is the pointer. It doesn't really work unless it's directly on the screen, so pointing with your finger is probably better. Yeah, Alright. Um, I'm going to clip this right here. Mm -hmm. That's okay. That's okay. That's fine. Oh, no, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, I know. And so um, it's stuck. Pause. We're going to notice it's like just take a deep breath. Take a deep breath and then start again. So um, you're really, really, really proud of what you've done. Yeah. And you share it. And it's your journey, your story. All right. Because you've done all this. All right. Oh, uh, we're just asking this. We're between those two tape lines, so just yep. on either side. And then mm -hmm. trying to. Face the audience instead of not yeah. back, you want to see your face. So we'll make this right. Sean's face for the video. Yeah. Like, and then I was told that for the recording, I have just to use the mouse yeah, on the computer. I think the clicker, I think the clicker will actually work, but if not, yeah, you can just. Uh, I think I'll just do this just yeah. for simplicity. Yeah, that's fine. All right. 
know we tested this now. All right. That's good. All right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know. A lot of people. A lot of people just wear pajamas. Yeah. Always pajamas. Yeah. A lot of people just wear pajamas or whatever they want. Right. Okay. Well, I just thought. Mm -hmm. No. 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 I'm fine. I'm fine in regular clothes. Yeah. All right. Yep. Yeah. All right. No, that's fine. All right, so next we have Jeremiah Adams, and Jeremiah took a look at um, the impact of music on our emotions. Jeremiah. All right. Good morning, everyone. As Ms. Johnson said, my name is Jeremiah Adams, and I did my project on how music affects people's emotions. So a little bit about myself. Um, in school, I participate in both the marching band and the symphonic bands that are done here. And outside of school, I am a Boy Scout in Troop 111 over in Charlottesville, where I got my Eagle Scouts earlier this year. And other than that, I, I play in a, in a youth symphony over in Charlottesville, where roughly 45 different musicians of various different ages come together and we play a bunch of different songs that are usually more high level than what we get to play in school. The reason I wanted to do this project is I love music. It has been a very big part of my life and shaped me to how I am today. And I always know that when I'm listening to music, I always feel really happy, never sad, and I was just a little confused on why that happens. So I have this quote from one of my favorite um, composers, Tchaikovsky. And I feel like it, is, it really encapsulates what my project is about. The quote is, music possesses much richer means of expression, and it is a more subtle medium for translating the thousand shifting moments of the feelings of the soul. So. My research question was, what is the impact of music on people's emotions? Throughout my research, I studied different musical scores, different songs, and a bunch of different books to figure out basically music psychology. And the biggest thing I figured out was if you like music, and specifically if you like a certain genre of music, such as rock music, classical music, pop music, your brain is going to release more, um, was it serotonin? Yeah, that, that one, the one that makes you feel happy. <laughs> and so that chemical gets released in your brain and helps you feel happy, helps you get into a better mood whenever you listen to that music. Specifically, through one of the studies I read, uh, the three most, uh, three genres of music that uh, 
makes people the happiest is pop music, classical music, and jazz music. A majority of my research was about studying a paradox known as the tragedy paradox. This uh, paradox plainly says that when you're listening to sad music, you, logically you think, oh, this is sad, this is depressing, I should not like this. But as many of us come to know in our daily lives, we listen to sad music and even though it is sad, we feel happy and want to listen to it more. And so, as I previously stated before, um, the reason for why you like the sad music is because, well, simply you like music and it helps you feel better. So, this is my internship mentor, Elijah Steele. I met him through um, the band here at Madison County High School because he is, he is the one who writes all of our music for marching band and all of our drill that we march to. Elijah is based out of Richmond and he is a percussion instructor, composer, and arranger for many different bands, including JMU. And so, working with him, a lot of my time was spent with writing music and then I would send it to him for him to revise. He would send it back to me and we would keep on uh, exchanging information until we got to a final project. So right here, this is the um, this is the platform I use to write my music, which is called Music Score. And you see all the different lines of music over there on that page. And how this works is I have to go into each individual line for every single instrument of an ensemble and place a note down one at a time for it to eventually sound good all together. This process takes roughly five hours to do, depending on the length of the song, and it takes multiple days to write any bigger works. There is one more thing that I added very fast to my project, which was in the Youth Symphony I play in, I play in the French horn section. And in that section, we had a song for our last concert cycle that was not written in the correct key for our instrument to play in. So what I did is I transposed from the key it's written in to the key that we're supposed to play in. I know many of you don't know what transposition is. I don't blame you. It is a weird thing to learn. But this is a basic understanding. So the top note right here, that would be the note that you see on the page that I would be playing. But in, in reality, the second note is what you hear. And so my job was to make sure that they match together into the correct keys. So next on, I have my community service, which was split up into three major sections. The first section was creating stand band music, which is the music we play in the stands during marching band. And creating, with that, I created three different songs, or arranged three different songs. So the first one was the final countdown. The second was the Seven Nation Army. And the third was Shake It Off. And right here is a picture of the eighth grade night where all eighth grader um, band kids went up and played with us. And this is a picture of us playing one of the songs I wrote. Over there on the right side of the screen is our fearless um, music teacher here at Madison County, Mr. Coates. He is awesome to work with. He is very fun to talk to, and he has helped me a lot with getting my project going and continuing to schedule stuff so we can play at the end of the semester. Knowing that, this is the second part of my community service, where I created something known as a chamber ensemble. That is a small group of musicians that come together and play works without a full ensemble. And so I created one here at Madison County and on the same day as the Senior Expo for our class, that night we are going to be performing this in the spring concert over in the auditorium here. 
this is a song that I composed, which means I sat down with a blank sheet and I wrote out every note by thought. And so this shows the full range and all the instruments that we are going to be playing. Now, to moreover say the significance of what music is to me, I think you all have heard enough of me talking, so I put a recording in here of, the, of a song that my use, not my use, the use symphony I play in, uh, performed our, on our last concert cycle. So I wanted to play that for you all here. That short little recording was one of the big uh, full ensemble sections of the piece. And this piece, very fun to perform with them, and it's a very good example of happy music. It, throughout the piece, it's a bunch of very wacky little melodies that all come together and create this big section of music. So I have some advice to next year's seniors, which is, when you are thinking about your project, find, find first the topic that you love the most. For me, that is music. It can be anything you want, sports, airplanes, uh, medicine. But find something you truly love, and then what helped me the most is I planned my community service first. Because I thought, oh well, I wanted to write music. And I basically wanted an excuse to write music and play it with the people here. So I made that my community service. After that, I planned and then thought of, wait, why does music make us feel happy or sad? And so that's how I created my internship and my research question through it. So for my future plans, I'm going to be attending Virginia Tech to be a double major. The first major is going to be in engineering. I am hopefully going to be studying aerospace engineering, but I have no idea where the future will lead me, so stay tuned for that if you're interested. The second thing is I'm going to be a music performance major. If it does not get too much workload, then I might put it as a minor. But you might think I'm weird, but I love math, so Putting these two together was a very uh, logical thing in my mind to do. Any questions? Well, that's a lot of people. <laughs> Evan? So the real struggle is finding what's your, so, in, mu in music, there's a motif called a melody. That is the part you want to hear. It's the very exciting part. The struggling part with writing music is you have to create it yourself. So that writing the melody for the song I created took two hours to think of and then write for it. The rest of it came pretty easy because melodies are very simple. You can repeat it just in a different place. So overall, that one took, I think, 10 hours to create for two minutes of music. Eric? So throughout my research, I found a lot of connections as well. So do you feel like you are almost speaking a different language or like telling a story in a different language when you're composing music? That's actually a very interesting thing. Well, I want to uh, more goes towards uh, my performance. Uh, for it, um, I play a lot of Russian, Italian, and French music in my Yusufni. And each different place has their own different type of music. For example, Russian music is very strict and uh, linear. Well, as Italian music is more fun and poppy, which is um, 
The recording I played you was from an Italian composer, Rossini. And it's usually more bright in its sound. So each different culture has their own type of music. Is that a question? Um, you're in your research. Did you find anything about like how music can affect emotions other than <coughs> being happy, like being sad? And uh, yes. The biggest one I tried to do with that one is the tragedy paradox, as I explained. But the biggest thing I found is that if you like music, you're going to feel happy about it. But if you do not like music, for example, if someone despises pop music, they're going to feel hatred towards it and they'll get bad and it'll set off bad chemicals in their brain saying, turn this off, this is stupid. <laughs> Aiden? I was just really curious on how you like the music. Are you more theory based or do you kind of just have your own opinion? So, are you asking how I determine if I like a piece of music or? Like when you were writing your music, how did you decide that well, this is pretty good? Like, is there a certain method you did to get those <coughs> melodies, or was it kind of trial and error? I'm just curious. That is a good question. Um, most of it is basically trial and error. You have an original thought in your mind, and then the hardest piece, hardest piece of writing music is taking the thought that you have in your mind and put it onto a thing that is not forgiving in any sort of way. And so you think about it, you write it down, and see if it matches with your brain. And it, that process takes too long to talk about. <laughs> Are there any more questions? Mm -hmm. I would say that all depends on what your topic is. For example, mine is on music, and I am, because of my background of performing a lot of music, I am very well versed in how music works. So I didn't have to do as much research into how music works, but into how music affects your brain. So but for you, I would say find the parts of your project that you are not as well versed in and focus on researching that. Are there any more questions? So, yeah. Okay. 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 I don't think so. Okay. Okay. Um, next up, we have Ian Barb, and Ian explored the impact of team, being on a team, and how that impacts um, us psychologically. Ian Barb. Thanks to Ms. Johnson for introducing me. My name is Ian Barb, and I chose to do a, the topic of mental health in uh, youth sports. So a little bit about me first. I am... Um, I've been a part of Beta Club this year. I've been on the Madison County wrestling team since my sophomore year. Um, and I chose this topic because when I joined the wrestling team, I didn't really have any idea on how, your, uh, on how a team atmosphere affects you as a person, not just your team building skills, but your life skills and just different parts about yourself. 
And so I chose this project to learn a little bit more about the psychology aspect of sports and how that positively benefits someone's life, not just in high school, but on their many years to come in their adult life. So my research, my driving question was, how does a team atmosphere positively affect a youth's mental health and life skills? So when exploring this topic, I found a lot of information that I did not think that I was going to find. And the most helpful one was the when we went to the UVA library to do our research, I found a lot of interesting papers from different psychologists about how um, sports psychology has been such an important topic here recently. Now that there is so how sports affects so many different parts of our lives, not just our high school, but just in general. And so when I was doing my research, I found the three most beneficial parts to being on a team is the teamwork skills that you learn along the way, the role models that you meet and that you can learn from, and all of the socialization opportunities of being part of a high school sport. So for my quote, I chose a quote from Mr. Phil Jackson. And Phil Jackson is the head coach of an NBA team. He was the head coach for 20 seasons nine seasons for the Chicago Bulls and 11 seasons for Los Angeles. And um, the quote that I stumbled upon from him is, good teams become great ones when the members trust each other enough to surrender the me for the we. And I found that really impactful because when um, people are in sports, they think that it's all on their shoulders, that they have to, they have to do all of the work. And one of the things that he's talking about here is you have to let your team help you and learn to meld with your team and create and problem solve and just work together to achieve a common goal. So for my expert interview, I interviewed Dr. Bob Harmison. He is the head of the, um, the JMU sports psychology department. And I had a Zoom conversation with him last semester where we talked about the impacts of being on a team, the, um, the real world experiences that he has um, observed being a part of the college um, sports athletics and he noticed that there was many a different um, women and men that join the different sports at JMU and how they have grown as people, how some of the, um, the foreign students learned a lot more about America, how they became more um, out there as a person, how they created so many new relationships on the team and just how they were generally beneficially impacted by being part of the team. So for my professional learning experience, I was, um, I have served as a junior coach for the Madison Marksman team. And that is a 4-H Marksman team that is, um, serves age, kids ages 9 to 19, so there is a wide range of different kids that can join the program, and I have gotten to and continue to observe different relationships between teams and how the new shooters that joined would kind of come out of their shell and make so many new friends on the team and learn different things. Now, my professional learning experience mentor was the head coach, Maria Walren. She has about a decade of experience on being the head coach of the team and also has more coaching experience than just that before she was the head coach. So she is a certified rifle, archery, and um, shotgun coach. So she has plenty of experience teaching different kids something that, may, that they may not have any um, experience in. So it was really great learning a lot from her and learning how kids interact with each other and how they are benefited positively from the team. So these are the two ranges that the marksman team practice on. This is the archery range and this is the, um, the air rifle and BB range. On the archery range is they're both over at the American Legion building just off of Main Street and every Monday from about five to nine o'clock they have a weekly practice where all of the kids practice archery and their BB and then over the fall seasons they also practice at one of the coaches houses on the different other on the other disciplines that they can't practice there at the Legion. So um, I noticed that some of the new shooters that were joining they were kind of um, 
to them. They kind of kept to themselves. They didn't really interact with anybody else. And in talking to some of the shooter's parents, I also learned that this was kind of a um, common denominator with some of the kids. They had never really socialized more than just at school. And so some of the parents were treating this not only as a sports team, but as socialization opportunities to get their kids more um, more skilled in creating new relationships and just teamwork skills and life skills in general. And then for my community service, I conducted a presentation with the um, with one of the freshman gym classes, and I provided or I presented about the benefits of joining a high school sport and how you can learn so many different things. And so it was actually kind of great because in talking to Ms. Makarski before the presentation, she said that in their class, they were already talking about mental health and time management. So my presentation worked in perfectly to what they were already talking about. And so my um, community service mentor was, of course, Ms. Makarski, the teacher who let me present to her class. And she was a really big help because um, she allowed me to present not only, but provided feedback for the presentation and just um, tips and tricks to help me personally in my life as a student athlete and just tips and tricks for other people to learn from and to um, grow themselves as people. So um, my advice for future students is to, of course, pick a topic that you are passionate about. I picked this topic because I didn't really know a lot about it, and so I wanted to learn more about um, sports psychology and the benefits of joining a team sport. And so my biggest problem was not um, holding with the schedule that Ms. Johnson so graciously put together. So she puts a schedule for a reason, I didn't follow it, and I did not really um, benefit from that. I was It was a lot of extra stress that on top of being part of wrestling, and so just stay on time. Don't procrastinate like I did. And um, the one thing that I found was helpful was to um, pick your topic and then build your community service around that because that is what I found the most difficult part of planning for the presentation because during my community service, I attempted to do a presentation in the auditorium for the community with um, Dr. Bob from JMU, but our schedules just didn't line up and it ended up not working out. So I had to scrap my original community service um, idea and go with the presentation with the freshmen. And so just plan out, plan all of the things that you're going to do and follow the plan or just follow Miss Johnson's plan because it was really good. <laughs> um, so uh, my future plans, I plan to attend Virginia Tech in their engineering department and hopefully um, pick up a specialization in mining engineering. And now that it has nothing to do with sports psychology, <laughs> I more have a passion for geology, but I wanted to learn a lot more about sports psychology and just how that is important with the uh, different high school students and how um, the, uh, the sports can affect you positively. Um, so thank you. Are there any questions? Yes. So the people that were on teams, they learned the two things that I thought that were the greatest benefit was the teamwork that you learn because teamwork not only helps you in athletics, but later down the line when you're working on a project with coworkers, you use those team those teamwork skills to solve problems or complete tasks that are assigned. And then the socialization aspect. When I joined wrestling, I had never really socialized with any of the other graduating classes. And so I met a lot of different people from the seniors of every year, the juniors of every year, the sophomores, and even some of the eighth graders that had joined. I got a, I um, gained a couple of friends in all of the eighth grade years. And so it's just really beneficial as a whole, 
but there are different specifics that you can pick out to like focus on those. And then in your background research, did you find that there was a real like emphasis on it being sports team or was it more kind of more like sports Activities have similar benefits. So, I mean, like marching bands and friends are sort of like yeah. Um, so for the it's more of the organized sports because they are forced to um, work t <laughs> because they're kind of forced to work together with like basketball or football. You have to learn those team building skills. Whereas if you're in an after school program, you can just kind of blow it off or you don't like think of it as important as much because there's not really you're not really um showing for other people so like when you're on a sports team you are presenting yourself for your different spectators and the people that are watching and there's just more of an emphasis on performance on the sports yes Yes. Well, I hope to. Um, <laughs> it's actually kind of a hard question. I talked to my mom about that, actually. It's going to be really hard to um, create a schedule and stick to it, but I am going to attempt to have a planner involved, plan out the time. And even during my community service, I talked about how don't let your week. Uh, plan you you plan out your week time by time where you do your work and then you also set aside maybe a day or three hours in a day uh, set aside time for you so you don't feel like it's all work 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 and you can't relax at all yes so I don't really have as much research there, but just more with personal experience on wrestling, where it is a team sport as it is an individual sport. When you're on the wrestling team, it is ultimately up to you whether you win a match or not. And so you just use your teammates more of as moral support and inspiration. And just that's your reason for motivation is to perform well so your other teammates don't have as much pressure put on them. Any other questions? On your jacket. I'm just gonna move your hair so I don't clip your hair in it. You're good. Yeah. All right. Great. Thank you. And then the clicker is just next this way, back that way. If you push the wrong direction, just push the other direction. No big deal. Um, this is the pointer. You can like just head on the TV with that. It won't show up. So pointing your finger is probably better than the pointer. Okay. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Give that to you. Um, just remember the most important thing is to breathe. Right. Your brain can't. So when you can't think of what you need to say, you get stuck. Pause. Take a nice deep breath. Nobody will notice. And then we're going to have a little, a little extra oxygen, right? Mm -hmm. And then get back to it. Okay. So look at the picture. See what you're at. And then just start talking, right? Because we don't know what you have planned. To say. So it doesn't have to match up exactly the way you have designated like for each slide. Okay. Pause. Oh, 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 and share it. Face that way. Um, I see you. Yeah. 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 Ye
keep that in, okay? I would never agree. Okay. I'm just starting from the You can pause for a second. Okay. And then just okay. you go on. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. it, it does really help. You. And it's only for a few minutes. Can you do something hard for a few minutes? Yeah. I think you've probably done harder things than this. Probably. And so, so just know I can do this too. Because I've done all this. Okay. 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 I want these to do your intro. Are we ahead of schedule? We're um, like a couple minutes behind. Oh, okay. Well, then we should go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good morning, everyone. As Ms. Johnson said with that lovely introduction, my name is Courtney Weekly, and I am doing my project on technology and agriculture over the ages. So a little bit about me. I am the president of the 4-H Club here in Madison County. I am also in FFA with Ms. Kaufman, our ag teacher here. And I do participate in Beta Club, run varsity track and field, and varsity cross country. So I also live on a 10 acre farm here in Madison, of course, and just being around animals has inspired me to do my, my project on agriculture. And so here in this picture is me and my sister when I was younger and I was in Clover Buds and this is Sugar Cookie. <laughs> and so my sister was actually in college growing up, so I didn't really get to see her a lot. <laughs> and so she really wanted to be a veterinarian and that made me want to be a veterinarian and I walked around with a veterinarian coat on sometimes and I thought I was going to follow my sister but I had a change of heart but she is definitely one that inspired me to love agriculture and be around it as much as possible and then there's also me still in 4-H with of course a bigger cow bigger steer now and that's Tank over there. So my quote of quality that I had is, if agriculture goes wrong, nothing else will have a chance to go right. And this is by MS Wami Nathan. <laughs> and so I thought this quote was very impactful because agriculture is a big part of our economy and our world. And without it, nothing else really can go right because agriculture needs to feed us. and of course, we need to be fed to survive, right? <laughs> so a little bit of background information and the history of my project. This is a steam and gas engine. I went to the steam and gas show in Somerset. This was during the fall. And while I was there, I took pictures and I really enjoyed it. I've never been to a steam and gas show before. So that was a really cool experience for me. And this engine was used probably in the 1900s at some point. Before that, of course, they had horse and plows to do all the farming, and then they moved to this, and then now they have self-driving tractors, which is really cool. <laughs> and so this picture, the picture over there was taken during ag class last semester, and we got to see a self-driving tractor which you basically just press the brake and it goes and there's a mapped out course of where it can go and you just set in it and it does all the work for you. So this is where we're at today with our technology and that's pretty cool with agriculture and it makes it more proficient and efficient to do more and get more uh, product back. So my research question is how has technology impacted the agronomy and turkey industries and agriculture? So I had to narrow down my topic a little bit because agriculture is such a broad field. So I picked two that I was really passionate about, including agronomy and the turkey industry. And for my research, I researched different equipment that is used in the agronomy industry. So one was drones. And they have these big drones now that actually can fly over the field 
and map out different areas of the field and see whether the crops are doing good or if the soil is doing good or whether they need to put fertilizer down there to keep the crops alive and have more product in the end. And then another one I looked at is the GPS or the global positioning system. And with that, you can map out where you want to go. And there's basically a screen. And after you go over it, it'll paint over it so that you don't go over the same place twice. And this reduces waste with different chemicals and all of that is used in the field. And then with turkey industry, I got to look into barn technology and how the barns have all these different features now. And you can control the temperature or the water, like how much chlorine or chemicals are in the water and how the automated feed system works throughout the barn. And you can also get, like you can have an app on your phone that tells you if something's going wrong at the barn or you get an alert and you can go there right away instead of waiting and getting there in the morning and, be, and there be something wrong. So for my professional learning experience, I did it at, well, I originally was gonna go to a tractor dealership in Orange and they were like, hey, we only sell like a really nice tractor like once every two years or so. So they directed me towards the co-op and when I was there, I got to do my professional learning experience with Jason Goff which is the agronomy manager there. And if anybody knows farmers, they don't like getting their picture taken. So <laughs> I don't have a picture of him. <laughs> so over on the far side is a picture of the fertilizer applicator that I got to ride around in. And I he almost let me drive, which I thought I was going to get to drive it, but <laughs> it didn't work out. But it's really big. It's bigger than what it looks like. Uh, it's really fun to set in. We got to ride around in it, and this was on my first day, so I was just and I was just shocked. I was like, "Wow, I never knew so much was that ever grow." And then over here is a picture of one of the screens, and that basically shows all the statistics, statistics that are there on one of the screens. And then there, of course, there's another screen that shows like where you're going and how I talked about how they map out where you're going so you don't go to the same place twice, and then. There's also, I'm pretty sure it's on this screen, if you look into it more, how much fertilizer goes where and like if you need to stop because there's, so, there's a whole bunch of different spinners in the back that throw out the fertilizer everywhere. So it controls how much is used where. So for the other part of my internship, I went to the turkey barn and in this picture, this is half of the turkey barn a couple of days before the turkeys came in. So we were there setting it up and then of course, on the other side is one of the big panels that controls like the temperature or the automated feed system that I was talking about or the water as well. So for my community service, I went down to Ms. Kaufman's classroom and this is Ms. Kaufman, my mentor. And I talked to the kids down there about how technology and agriculture is really important. And I talked to them about different equipment that's used there and how different jobs. There's not all hands-on jobs that you have to do. There's also like engineering you can get into or different jobs of that nature. And <laughs> it was really fun. So this is my data that I got back. And if I were to do this differently, I probably would have done it on paper because I didn't get as much data back as I was hoping for. And so one of the questions was, do you believe you learned something new today about technology and agriculture? And in the industry. So of course all of them said 100%. I was really happy about that so they all learned something new. And another question was what was this a good educational experience and all of them said yes again. So I was very grateful that they learned something from it and that they got an impact from it and hopefully it'll make some, like a significant impact for them to know that you can do more than just hands-on and that there's technology and modern stuff in agriculture. So another question that I asked, this was free response. I just kind of wanted like an inside scoop at what I could improve on or what they really liked about it. So I asked them what was their favorite part and some of, them in, some of the answers included explaining on the turkey barn and the cooling and heating, being able to learn new things, learning about the tractors and the GPS and drones. 
So some advice I give, y'all probably already heard this already, but pick something you're passionate about. That is so, so important. You need to pick something that you're passionate about. So mine, of course, was agriculture, and I could just talk about it and talk about it and talk about it. <laughs> but I only have like 10 minutes to talk about it today. So that's one. And then, of course, plan ahead. You need to plan ahead. You need to get your internship planned. <laughs> plan your internship. Because I didn't get mine planned until probably October. And then I was missing Ms. Johnson's class in the morning, going to my internship learning about crops and all. And so just make sure you plan ahead. And then another one is communication. You need to make sure you communicate with your mentors at all times. You need to communicate on whether something changes or whether you can do what you have to or not. And yeah, and then another one that I thought about while I was sitting here listening to everybody else is ninth graders through juniors, everybody in governor's school, it all adds up to this. All the skills that you learn, it all adds up to this. So my future plans, I haven't decided where I want to go yet, but I know I want to do something with either EKG technician or being a nurse in the cardiac rehab unit. I know that's very different, so I want to make sure I spit out everything that I could about agriculture now, since I'm not doing anything about that later. And yeah, thank you. Do I have any questions? Pretty expensive sounding technology, especially if I go oh, yeah. to local tractor dealers, wholesale department that I want every like. Yeah, they don't they don't sell them that often. I'm guessing you wouldn't find this in your background research. I'm curious if you would know this with like FFA or 4H. How many of those kinds of things are even employed in like Madison schools? It's pretty agrarian community, mm -hmm. but it seems like it'd be a much larger farm that would be able to provide that kind of thinking. Yeah, so while I was with my internship working with Jason, they take their the fertilizer applicator and they can go to different farms that might not have it, and they pay them pay them to go spread their fertilizer for them. And then they also are trying to get a grant. I don't know if they got it or not, because while I was there, they were working on it. But to get drones at Evergrow that can go and spray over the crops instead of the big fertilizer applicators coming in. So. Do we have any of those kinds of barns? Turkey barns? Yeah. Like the yeah. Yeah. Ian? So when you're talking about those AI self-driving tractors, is there still somebody sitting in the cockpit or is it just driving itself? Yes. Somebody will still be sitting in the cockpit. I don't know if they can or like have to be in there, but I know when we, when I went and I seen a self-driving tractor, somebody was still sitting in there because you have to press the brake and then of course the rest does itself. Yes. I actually didn't really get into that. I know a little bit about it, and it's actually really fascinating how they like just want to have that since there is so much that goes into it. But I didn't really focus on that. Any more questions? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Next is just that way. Okay. And then go back. Okay. Don't push the wrong direction. Just push the other direction. So okay. Make it this really works if it's head on. Okay. Really I don't so just need that, do I? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, All right. The most important thing is sleep. Yeah. Right? Your brain can't function without oxygen. 
It's pretty. Uh, it's take a deep breath. Nobody's gonna notice, right? So yeah. you give your brain a little extra oxygen, and it'll help you get started again. Okay. Yes. Um, but again, we don't actually know what you're saying. Right? Yeah. So it it doesn't matter. There's no right or wrong. Look at the picture and, and talk about what's going on in that okay. in this, in this slide. Okay. Are you proud of what you've done? Yes. Then this is your chance to share that, right? Like you have done the hard work. Yeah. Now you're telling us right. all these cool right. things that you've done and accomplished. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's it's only a few minutes. Yeah. Can you do something hard for a few minutes? Yeah. You probably do harder things than yeah. this. So just get up there and share what you've done. So right. this Johnson will introduce you. We just want you to see an image between the two lines. Right. Migrating the mm. Yeah. Breathing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Thank you. It's my dad's. <laughs> <laughs> I stole it. <laughs> what? Yeah, I'm ready. All right, everybody. Um, we're going to move to our next presentation, which is Sam Bartek. And Sam started with his love of and interest in our natural surroundings and um, did a deep dive on the history of our natural surroundings. Sam. Thank you. All right, my name is Sam Bartzak, and I did my presentation on unveiling the history of Virginia's Blue Ridge Mountains, specifically the mountains surrounding Madison and the other counties uh, which encompass Shenandoah National Park. Okay, my topic, um, I first became interested in uh, the history of the mountains when I did um, Appalachian Conservation Corps in 2022. Um, ACC is an eight-week program. Um, they're based in Harrisonburg, and they send out uh, crews of about eight to ten people to perform conservation work throughout state parks in West Virginia and Virginia. So for eight weeks, I was camping with this crew, um, and we just did various tasks in the mountains um, and different state parks, doing whatever they needed us to do, um, mostly maintaining trails and performing work on roads and stuff. And uh, during my time at this job, I became very interested in the mountains and the history. Um, so after my completion of ACC, I started a hike in Shenandoah. You can see a few pictures here. Um, and just started to notice how much history is uh, lying within our mountains. Um, and that's just what really got me interested in this topic. So my research question was, what is the history of our local Appalachian region? Um, this is a question that got narrowed down more as I researched, which I'll talk about more in a minute. But this was just my general question that started my research um, at the beginning of the year. So my research, my research focused on the people that once lived in Shenandoah National Park. Um, most of you guys are probably aware that there was a large population of people that lived in what is now Shenandoah National Park up until about the mid-1930s. Um, these people had houses, economies, jobs, um, farms, and whole lives in the national, or what is now the national park, which was all taken away when the national park was created. Um, so I, in my research paper, went over how these people lived, um, how, how their economy was, what they did for work, everything about them. And then I discussed the creation of the national park which encompassed the removal of these people. And then I dived deeper into the removal process of this large population of people and the controversy surrounding this process because there was a lot of mistreatment by the government and um, other facilities that just kind of uh, caused a lot of controversy, especially in our local region. And so here's just a few pictures of uh, people that once lived up in the mountains. Um, so this here is the Civilian Conservation Corps. This was the group of young men that was hired to create the National Park and do the manual labor for the government. 
Um, they were a huge part of creating Skyline Drive in the National Park. Um, and there's a picture of Skyline Drive. Um, if you guys aren't familiar, Skyline Drive is just the road that crosses through the entire National Park and um, hits most of the major destinations in the park. So my mentor was Mr. Max Lacey. Um, Max is a member of the Madison County Historical Society. Um, I met Max at the Mount Museum at Kriglersville, which is a museum which covers um, the history of our local mountains and kind of a lot of the stuff that my project encompasses. Um, Max is at the museum every Sunday from March through, I believe, December. And um, the museum is just full of stuff uh, regarding the history of the National Park and our mountains and the people who once lived there. And so this was another huge part of why I became interested in this topic. Um, I visited here last spring and um, for the first time and quickly became very interested in our local history as I saw a lot of connections um, being made between the history of our mountains and our current lives in Madison. Um, but yeah, Max was a huge help in my project. He helped me with my community service, which I'll get into in a minute. And he also um, was able to lend me a ton of books, which helped me with my research. So very, th very thankful for him. So community service. Um, the first part of my community service was a one-day event at the um, Kriglersville Mountain Museum. Um, it was called the, I'm not sure what it was called actually, but it was just a bunch of um, local artisans and um, vendors who were gathering to celebrate the history of our mountains and honor the traditions of the people who once lived there. So you can see just a bunch of people with art, books. Um, on the end, you can see a table with people making um, old food that uh, the people who lived in the mountains ate. And then my booth was a two trifold display booth where I was educating people who were interested about the history of our national park, um, the removal process of the people who lived in the national park. And um, as well as that, I was asking people questions about any ancestral connections they have to the national park because if you guys aren't aware, there are many people who live in Madison that can actually draw connections to their family who once lived in the mountains. So I was just surveying to see if um, anyone could tell me any stories about stuff like that. And then there's a, um, I believe it's a Ford Model T that someone brought to exhibit, which I thought was pretty interesting. Um, here's me talking to um, Bill Henry. Bill is the creator of the Blue Ridge Heritage Project, Project which is a nonprofit organization that create um, statues and landmarks to honor the people who once lived in the National Park. Bill is super knowledgeable about the history of the Blue Ridge Mountains. Um, so he's actually the person who I used for my expert interview. And he was also a huge help in my project. And then here you can just see me talking to some visitors about my project and uh, the history of our area. The second part of my community service, um, with the help of uh, another BRVGS student, Scout Foskett, we went up to the National Park and helped clean up a campground with the help of some park rangers. Um, so here, we're just cleaning out fire pits. There's one of the fire pits that we were cleaning out. Um, picked up trash, all that kind of stuff. And then after that, we applied the skills that we learned there at a more local level and took our work to Hoover Ridge. Um, which is a park right across the street from here. Most of y'all probably know what it is. Um, and then we just did some work on the trails um, and helped them with whatever else they needed in their park. So my personal learning experience was, again, um, divided into two parts. The first part, I was a part of a trail crew who was in charge of maintaining trails within the central district of the National Park. So here, um, for my one day with the trail crew, we um, hiked down the Rose River Trail and um, hauled buckets of dirt 
to create a set of stairs up kind of like a rocky slope on one of the harder parts of the hike. So here you can just see us um, loading buckets full of dirt and then kind of dumping the dirt inside of a wooden frame and then tamping it down to, I'm not sure what, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, we just hauled buckets of dirt and then tamped it down to create a, uh, a set of stairs for hikers to use um, on the trail. And then the second part of my internship or my personal learning experience was interning with a archeologist who works at the Shenandoah National Park. Um, I don't have a picture with her, but here's a picture of me with two of the park rangers that accompanied us that day. <clears throat> Um, over that day, we visited various archaeological sites through the National Park and assessed them for damage. Um, as the archaeologist, um, she was in charge of evaluating each site for damage, but not fixing the sites because um, archaeologists' only responsibilities are to just assess the damage, but not restore the damage of the sites. So. We visited an old cemetery, um, the Cave Cemetery, and we also visited an old house foundation, as well as a few other different sites throughout the National Park um, to assess them for their condition. And yeah. So what I learned, um, I learned a lot about the local history of the mountains. Um, I learned a lot about the processes which are currently used to preserve our history, which I thought was probably the most interesting part of my project. I learned um, what methods are used to preserve the trails throughout parks and what maintenance methods are used. And um, that's about it. And then advice to future seniors. I would just say, choose something you're interested in, just like everyone else said, but that really is the most important thing. Choose something that you're going to want to work on because you're going to be spending a lot of time on this project. And then most importantly, take this seriously because this actually can be a super beneficial experience if you actually put effort into it. Like I didn't expect to really get much out of this project, but I made tons of connections, learned so much in the short time that um, the project was held and it was just re really a beneficial experience. <clears throat> Future plans, um, I've been accepted to Virginia Tech and UVA. Not sure where I'm going to go yet, but I'm going to major in civil engineering um, and hopefully get out of college with a four-year bachelor's degree in civil engineering. Questions? <laughs> yep. These were European settlers who um, just lived in the mountains just like you would live in a house today. Like they just, they just lived much more traditional lifestyles because they lived in such a secluded area. But they were just really just normal people um, living their lives in the mountains. I mean, really just normal people. Yes? So, um, <clears throat> depending, some people were offered um, new places to live and others were offered money compensation. I think they were given the choice between the two. I'm not completely sure, but um, so I know some were um, provided housing and others were just provided like money for the value of their property because obviously the, the value of every person's property at that time was going to vary. So, yeah. Yes? Yeah. Yep. Yes, I had multiple people um, come up to me and share their um, family lineage, um, which dated, which they could trace very far back. I was very surprised. Um, and I had one person actually show me an entire photo album of his family, which used to live in the national park or what is now the national park. So it was um, actually kind of an eye-opening experience to how how many people um, this actually affected. Um, at the time, yeah. I mean, a lot of um, the museum 
has a lot of um, pictures from these people. I was more just um, surveying for my research paper, but um, yeah, I didn't I didn't donate any of the information to the museum. Any other questions? Is there what doing donating my? Yeah, yes, that was actually um, initially my idea was um, gather, taking my research paper and donating it to the museum, but I really just haven't gotten around to doing it yet. But I think it'd be cool if I um, some like created like a final version of it and kind of like had it in the museum for people to read. Yeah. Anything else? <clears throat> I need to look like Barbie. She looks beautiful. Uh, Ralph Rollers. You look better than Barbie. I wish you do. Because you're not plastic. I'm going to put it right here. Is that okay? That's fine. Am I allowed to stand over there? You are. So we're just asking you to sit in the two crates and then facing in the direction of that tape. Okay. Um, again, this is next back. If you okay. push the wrong one, just push the other one. So okay. Sure. This only works if it's head on. Okay. So probably pointing is better. Mm -hmm. Remember to breathe. All right. Your brain can't function without us. Remember that. Okay. Okay, I'm here. So if you just take a deep breath. Nobody will notice it. And then you can start back up. Give your brain a little boost of oxygen. Okay. 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 I'm gonna go stand over there. Okay. All right. We have two more presentations. Um, so our next one is Bethany Powers, and Bethany started with her interest and explored the role of women. As Ms. Johnson said, I'm Bethany Powers, and this is my senior caption project on women in business. A little bit about me, I've gone to Madison County High School for all four years and been actively involved in several extracurricular activities and leadership positions such as class president, social media coordinator, and currently serve as chair of the principal's cabinet committee, as well as historian for the class of 2024. In the past two years, I've completed over 100 hours of community service in my high school middle school and around my community and state and i've even had the opportunity to start my own nonprofit organization called beautifully you which i'll talk about more about in my community service part of this project in my free time i enjoy reading hanging out with my friends and family and photography and content creation a little background on why i chose this topic my grandparents started ryan funeral home in 1964 which is located was located in Rutgersville, Virginia. They continued to successfully run it up until my grandfather's passing in 1995, and then that's when my grandmother took over, which she ran until 2003 when my mom took over. So while most kids' newborns um, first visit is to the doctors or friends or family, mine was to the funeral home. I think I was a week old, and that's the first place I went. <laughs> And in 2020, I got the opportunity to observe firsthand what it's like to run a business and specifically as a woman, which sparked my interest to my senior capstone project and my research question of how are women in business affected and why we should be acknowledged. I saw firsthand my mom push against sexism in an industry that was predominantly run by men and people even tell her that she was money hungry just because she was trying to do her job as a woman. So I wanted to study this and find out why we're seeing only 29% of women in senior man management positions in the world, in the US specifically. For my internship, I completed it with Two Sisters Coffee, which is a mobile coffee truck in Culpeper. I reached out because they are two young women. They're in their early 20s and late teens, and I was really interested in their business plan and marketing. Seen here is a picture of their truck, Stevie, and they implement this into their marketing and social media and even merchandise, which I got to learn 
more about during my first initial meeting with them in early September. During this meeting, I got to help with marketing, finances, and being a woman in business, and even help create a social media post for their upcoming week of where Stevie would be. Uh, without going into too much detail about their financial situation, I did get to get a glimpse into their sources of income alongside the truck itself, which included merchandising, which I got to help create some of their merchandise that they are selling in their truck currently. And then I also got to look at brand consulting with the owner who is Lexi Bates, who is also my mentor. And I'll talk about that a little more in detail during my mentor part of this presentation. A couple weeks later, I got to help out in person at the truck. Um, and for this was for Ca National Coffee Day. They had partnered with Chabani Oat Milk, and I got to hand out these tote bags to the different customers. And this was really impactful to me because I saw 30 some people um, line up at 6.30 a.m., which was 30 minutes before the truck even opened, to support this local business, specifically run by women. I got to talk to these customers about why they came to this business, why did they support them, what made them drawn to this business in particular. One of my most memorable customers was a stay-at-home mom who also was an influencer, which I only learned later. She told me that she came to this truck not only because it has great coffee, but because it was a woman-owned business and she wanted to support these young women and their dreams and their hopes and their aspirations just like she does with other people on social media and just being a woman in general. A couple weeks later, this became more, even more impactful because I came back to the truck and some of these returning customers rem remembered me from my previous work, which is all around, you know, really nice <laughs> to uh, get that memorization and make those connections which is something I love to do. I like to talk. So <laughs> it's something that was really important to me. I got to discuss what it's like to be a woman in business during my mentor meeting with the owner and operator of Two Sisters Coffee, Lexi Bates. She started Two Sisters fresh out of college. So she was about 22 or 23 years old when she started it. And she had a lot of people from a lot of different backgrounds telling her how she should run things just because she was a woman. This ranged from anything, the name of the company, to financing, to marketing, to even the cabinet colors in the truck. And instead of confining to what other people expected from her, she confined to who she wanted to be, so leaning on the support of her mom, her friends, her family, the people who supported her for all her unique qualities, and pers persevered against this, being resilient. Something that really had an impact in, on me and what she said was find someone to look up to and don't listen to the people you wouldn't want to be. In 10 years, I'm not going to listen to a person I wouldn't want to be in their exact shoes. I'm going to listen to someone I would want to be, who I can see and inspire myself to mentor myself after them. And Lexi Bates is one of those people for me. And another one is my mom. My mom raised five kids while running, running a financially successful business, which is a very high demanding business. It's 24 hours. Um, of the day, 365 days a year. You can't help when someone passes away and you have to be prepared for that and have that emotional connection with your customers because that's a very vulnerable state for them. For my community service, I branched out and wanted to continue my community service initiative and nonprofit that I started the year prior called Beautiful You. This is an organization that promotes body positivity and educates on eating disorders in my high school and middle school. To expand on this, I created an entire website that would leave a lasting impact in my high school as well as my middle school in the years to come. And then I, alongside this, I also presented to a group of 20 eighth grade girls. And I chose this group specifically because 95% of individuals between the ages of 12 and 25 struggle with some type of self-esteem issue. And so I wanted to target this age range because they're very vulnerable especially with this transition between high school and middle school and high school. During my presentation, I spoke to them about what body positivity was, how you can gain it, and I also provided them with resources on um, eating disorders and how they can get the help they need slash deserve. Um, the reason I started my nonprofit in general was because growing up, I really struggled with my self-esteem and my confidence in myself. I didn't know how to 
help or gain that confidence in myself, as well as my older sister had an eating disorder and still struggles with an eating disorder um, for a big part of my childhood. I was think I was 10 years old when she first developed it. And I wanted to teach these girls how to become confident in their own skin so they can do whatever they want. Kind of like Barbie when you when Barbie says, I can do anything. That's really what I was trying to be for these young girls, but in a real life form. Um, I talk to them at how you can gain self-confidence and self-worth. And when we gain that, we're able to support ourselves and support others on their journey to whatever success in whatever industry they want to pursue. This was an incredible opportunity. Um, and I love talking with these girls. Afterwards, I had individuals come up to me and be like, I have a sister in the seventh grade. Can you present to them too? I think she really needs to hear this. And I was like, of course. I have not gone around to doing that yet, but I'm fingers crossed I can get to that by the end of the year. How does this all come back to my research and what did I learn from this? Um, I learned a lot. <laughs> With only 29% of senior management positions going to women, why do we see this lack of diversity in company boardrooms and how can we break this glass ceiling? Something that I learned during my research is women supporting women. We see a lot of women tearing each other down to get to the top, but why do we do that? And then in reality, what we should be doing is pushing against these gender and societal roles that the society has ingrained on this for the past 100 years and work together to fight and be resilient against these societal pressures. Some great examples of this are Oprah Winfrey and Whitney Wolf Hearn. These are two of my favorite entrepreneurs and support women supporting women as well as in specifically in the business industry. Oprah Winfrey not only fought against sexism but racism and persevered against what others had expected from her, as well as Whitney Wolf Hearn. She was the co-founder of Tinder and left after not being recognized for her work. She later became an entrepreneur and started her own company called Bumble, which is a dating app where the woman chooses first. Not only is she an incredible mentor in starting your own business, but she is a she advocates for women in the business industry as well as in sexual harassment cases across the country. My advice for future seniors, <laughs> you probably heard this many times today, start early <laughs> and choose something you love. There's so much going on in senior year. You have college applications, scholarship applications, all your classes, extracurriculars, and I'm soaking up that last year of high school. But you also have all these due dates for governor school and your senior capstone project. And if you choose something you love, choose something you're so passionate about. For me, that was women in business with my mom being in business and I, having so many sisters. I have three sisters for people who don't know. Um, I chose something that represented who I was and the feminist in myself really did come out and I enjoyed so much of my project. I loved making these personal connections with so many people in my community, community but also across the state. My future plans, I will be heading to the University of Virginia in the fall, double majoring with my first major being in commerce, commerce with two concentrations, one in marketing and finance, and my other major being in literature and English with a minor in media studies. I hope to one day work in the fashion marketing industry, bringing size inclusivity to social media and marketing. Any questions? <laughs> Um, so I was a professional pilot here working with the Marine Corps Center, mm -hmm. and one of the things that you said was one of the things that each other up was being introduced in that career and industry, and it's like 60% now mm -hmm. women. Um, but are, have you found a way to incorporate that with your peers and classmates so that you bring in those conversations? Um, I actually, I see this a lot. Um, a lot of drama happens in high school and middle school. And I feel like that's a lot of that female rivalry that we see within each other. But if we as um, individuals recognize that we're strong enough in ourselves, we can support other girls in whatever dream and whatever passion they have. And that's something I talked about during my community service initiative and how why do we tear each other down when we're also facing these same societal pressures? That's 
not what we should be doing. We should be lifting each other up because in the end, it's going to be better for us and better for others as well. Thank you. So, you know, this, this 29% number that you think is a really important one, I've been generally curious when you're doing background research on a company and where we're at, I guess, in the state of the industry. What was just something that stood out to you or stuck with you or was just like, huh? iceberg of a problem? Um, there's two things that really stuck out to me with this percentage. The first being that we're significantly behind other countries. Um, we are seeing close to 40% in Europe um, and in countries in Europe. And that's why, why as we as a first world country, like we're doing so many great things. We have so much technology. We have so much um, invent like eight um well i'm struggling right now sorry um innovations but why are we as a country not bringing more minorities into the board rate why are we not seeing that break in that glass ceiling why are we significantly behind so many other places another thing i really was fascinated by and found intriguing in my research was um that 67 percent of women don't want to take maternity leave because they're afraid they're gonna not get paid or they're gonna lose their jobs. And that's so unfortunate. And that goes right back into women supporting women. Why are we saying that it's not okay to have a kid? Or why are we saying that it's okay to have a kid? Why are they contradicting each other? Um, and we as a society should be celebrating whatever a woman chooses to do. Um, which I think is so impactful to my project in every industry, not just business. Uh, yes, my community service, actually. I had originally planned to do a presentation here at the high school, um, but unfortunately, schedules and um, my original mentor kind of had to step out of that. And so I had to push past that and be resilient. Um, and so I went back to the middle school and I said, hey, I would really love to do this. And I pushed against that. I also struggled with kind of refining my topic. I knew going into my senior year, I wanted to do marketing and finance. And I kind of wanted to um, see how that in I could incorporate that into my internship, which is why I spoke about it during my mentorship meetings um, and with uh, my shadow and uh, internship experience. Sorry. Any other questions? Thank you. <laughs> Okay. We're gonna clip this right on here. So, okay. Um, this is just forward and back. Step forward. If you push it the wrong direction, just push the wrong direction. Um, it only works if it's head on the screen. So if you want to point at something, it's probably better to point to your finger. Does that make sense? I'm going to leave that to you. The most important thing is your brain can function without oxygen. And if you get up there and you can't hear what you want to say, just take a pause, take a deep breath like I just did, if you'll notice it, and give your brain some extra oxygen, help you remember what you're talking about. Right? Look at your screen, see where you're at, start up again, right? If you don't know what you're planning to say, if there's no right or wrong, you just talk about what's going on in the picture, okay? Um, are you proud of what you've done? Thank you. that, right? Like, you did something too, you accomplished something, you've worked hard, you've done the work. And now you're sharing about that. You're telling us, right? And just remember, four minutes. Can you do something hard for a few minutes? Yes. You Wait, what did you say? Sorry. Can you do something hard for a few minutes? Oh, yeah. This <laughs> makes me a track. I gotta run that lap. Yes, run the lap. And that means that. So just remember that. So if 
freedoms keep breathing. That anxiety. Deep breath it out. Mm. Last one, we're going to play in two lines. Either side. All right, our last presentation, everybody, is Aiden Menifee, and Aiden focused his project around the science behind some of our, our behaviors. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, hello, my name is Aiden Menifee, and I did my project on the science of human behavior. In other words, this is a psychology-based project in which I did my internship, community service, and research paper, all based on psychology. So for a brief in introduction, I've been a part of BRVGS since ninth grade, as most of us are. I have taken various coding, coding classes and web development courses throughout BRVGS on top of the regular course load. I have done varsity track from 10th and 11th grade. Unfortunately, in my 12th grade year, I have not been able to do track since I am now working a job after school to save for college. But I still have taken a lot of my stuff I've learned from track and I put it into my everyday life. I still run sometimes and I have the free time and I exercise. I've learned a lot from track. I also enjoy a lot of outdoor activities. I enjoy hiking, fishing, skiing, and as I mentioned, running. So I, I always enjoy to find new hobbies as recently I've also started playing guitar and I enjoy finding these new hobbies as I feel like they're very beneficial to us to always find something new to learn for ourselves. So why this topic? One of my main influences for this choosing this topic was in my, my 10th grade AP Bio class where this was a very rigorous course, something I wasn't very used to at the time. So we would go really in depth in various different topics, including all of the body and a lot of the brain. And with the, the stuff we learned about the brain was where I gained a lot of my motivations for studying psychology in my senior capstone project. And we would look at various things such as uh, brain, uh, brain effects on drugs. And I just found that very interesting since we all have a brain and we all should know how to use it properly and how to take care of ourselves. And on top of that, I also listened to various podcasts and mental health and self-improvement podcasts that I would go on and off of phases of listening to these in my car on the way to school instead of listening to music. And I just really enjoyed learning about how to improve myself. So that's why I focused a lot of my project on psychology for my senior internship. The mentors, for my project, I had two mentors. Uh, on the left here is Dr. Comer Gaither. He works in the Madison Public School District. He works uh, a lot with primary education and elementary, but he also is shown around, he comes around the high school to work with various students of, such as those of in special education. And I'll get into a lot of what we did uh, for my internship. And then for my second mentor, I had Dr. Stephanie Sakara. She is now a assistant professor at UVA. At, when we were doing my internship, she was not teaching yet. She was in the process of setting up her lab to begin teaching. And I got to see a lot of that early process of what it takes to become a professor at UVA. So I enjoyed learning from both of these. They both are psychologists and they uh, both have a PhD and she graduated from University of Pittsburgh. And I'm not 100% sure where Dr. Comer Gaither graduated from, but I know they are both very intelligent people and I enjoyed learning from them as much as possible. For my internship, this is the part of work I did with Dr. Comer Gaither. Over here, there are, this is a testing kit that we used on a student in the primary school. This was very interesting to me because I've never seen any of these things before. And I'm pretty sure he said they were pretty confidential. He allowed me to use this photo. I made sure. And there's a lot of different things that I'm, I'm going to cover. So down here, we have these blocks. These are used to create a pattern that the child would uh, we have to repeat basically and we would see if they were able to do that and then there were some other things there's these pictures uh, these were used to like create patterns and pictures like find similar similarities if the child was able to pick out a certain amount of pictures and be like these are all related then we would give them a score and that's how basically we would figure out if a child qualifies for special education or needed help and we would find different learning disabilities and even as you can see over here, we would do some diagnosing of autism. We would 
Uh, these are some manuals that Dr. Comer let me read. Uh, these are pretty long, and I didn't get to go through a whole lot of them, but basically a lot of these things that he does is scoring, and that's what I got to take part in is help him score. Like I would check their motor ability, their motor skills, their visual abilities, some hearing, and just like a lot of different things that you wouldn't really think about goes on in our brain. But it was a, a very deep dive into all things that goes on in early education. Here's some more pictures of things we did. Uh, I'll cover this in a second, but right here is one of, this is one file for one child at our primary school. This is from, I believe, last April to, it's still ongoing if they want to refer her for special education. And I just was shocked with how much actually goes into deciding if these child, these children need to go into special education or not. And it was, and as you can see here, this is a, another thing that was also very surprising that there would be these various puzzles and things. And obviously to many of us, this looks pretty simple, but these are the realities of things that you test for. Even the very basic concepts of something of putting this puzzle to, together is difficult for some of these children. And that was something that really surprised me in this internship that how much goes in in the primary education to like actually other than just teaching them basics but we also they also have to identify what is going on and making sure that everyone is learning at a proper uh, rate and over here these are some more pictures that we use this was i uh, i called it the the zoo game or it was something like that but it had a square mat that was like divided up in certain sections and all was asked was there was a picture uh, that have, would have like a lion here, a zebra here, a tiger here. The child gets around like 10 to 20 seconds to view that image. And then they would be required to place those animals back into their original spots. And it sounds pretty easy for us, but obviously, like I said, this is what we're testing for if they can do these things. And unfortunately, I was able to see children that were not able to do this. So this was something that was very surprising to me. And like I mentioned, it opened my eyes up to how primary education works, how a lot of it is not just teaching, but it's also identifying certain learning disabilities. For my internship with Dr. Sakara, I she of course is at UVA, so I didn't get to visit her in person, unfortunately. So we had to do a lot of uh, in, the internship on Zoom call. So I would go every, every week or so, and I would join in the Zoom call with what is known as her lab, and there would be other students that were also studying psychology at UVA, and I got to see how they set up their lab and decided their research and their, what they wanted to test. Like I contributed to this, exactly what is happening here is we were over there on the whiteboard writing down certain questions we wanted to do, so I got to put my... Uh, thought into that and then they got to uh, give me feedback and I got to give them feedback so it was pretty interesting to see this because I had no clue that something like this actually goes on where people are setting up these labs for research and we would have to do other things such as finding grants and I got to see a lot of that and we got to also read like some papers and things and something else that Dr. Sakara did was give me a lot of presentations about her research as you can see here advancing understanding of adolescent social social Socio-emotional of development and mental health by studying social threat and reward processes. This was, this was one of the first presentations she gave me, and it went over a lot of social threat and reward processes of how people feel threatened by certain things of their peers and also how they feel rewarded by their peers. And this was something that I took and I gained a lot of inspiration from for my research project, as you'll see eventually. But it was very interesting hearing both, and this is... Um, Miss Cheyenne, she was also a part of it. She gave some presentations and just, just learning about what they were uh, studying at UVA for psychology just helped me, inspired me to like start studying that for my research project. So for my community service mentor, this is Miss Dawn Clement. She runs a business in Culpeper. I do not remember the name of it, but unfortunately she's unable to attend to it right now. But she is a psychologist and she does a lot of work there. A lot, of, a lot of work there, such as like therapy and helping spinal corrections and other things like that with your brain. She also works at, uh, she also used to work at the Correctional Center there in Culpeper for inmates, and she used to help study with them and help get them back out of these prisons and correct them. She, 
she didn't she not only helped me with my community service but she also was one of the starting points of where I learned how what I was going to do for my internship and she was overall just a great help through this whole project for my community service I decided to host a meditation event in Culpeper this was to raise donations as well as teaching people how to properly medicate I mean meditate or to um, learn how like meditation is commonly misconcept misconceived and different aspects of that we learned how to meditate and I believe uh, this picture right here it looks somewhat silly but this was actually after our meditation session we sat there for around what was supposed to be 30 30 minutes but we actually ran for around 45 and over here is Miss Karen Loving she was the meditation instructor for the time she was helped uh, Dawn actually helped connect me to her and she was uh, also a great help with this project she was more than welcome to do this and we got to learn how to meditate I found it very interesting and this may sound kind of outlandish, but I felt like sitting here in this meditation was bringing me back into my crib as a child. It was just so relaxing that I just imagined myself back there in that time. And I just really enjoyed this whole process. And here's just another picture of her studio. It's very relaxing. She has incense burning and music playing. And I actually really enjoyed this part of the project. And something else that I forgot to mention, but it's also very important. We raised a lot of money for a organization in Culpeper known as Encompass Community Supports. So I got to raise money and many BRBGS staff also donated because I did it online as well as at this event. So I was able to take that money there and they were more than grateful that I did that. They were so excited that they actually offered me an internship there to do like IT or something, but they were really grateful for that and gave me a gift box. and. Just doing these things like raising money and doing a project, setting this all up and organizing it and advertising it just really helped build my character because maybe about like in ninth and 10th grade, I couldn't imagine doing something like this where I'm actually building something myself and raising money and donating it. But seeing the faces of the ladies at Encompass just really opened my eyes to how I can actually do things in this world and help out and support my family, my peers, and anybody else that I don't even know. So for my research project, I had the driving question of how digital technology affects adolescence. This was, as I mentioned, inspired from Ms. Sa uh, Dr. Sakara's research. So I, go, I went over a lot of cognitive, social, emotional, and general well-being of how digital technology affects adolescence since I found this was very important as an adolescent myself and growing up in a high school with other adolescents, I wanted to see just exactly how digital technology helps or can diminish our psychological developments as adolescents. And I found pretty negative research that more than 90% of adolescents own digital technology, such as a mobile phone or a laptop or this and that, which obviously they need to own, but then looking at how long they spend on these devices is upward to seven hours or most of their awaking hours is spent on these devices. I just felt that was very shocking and I, I wanted to look into more of that. So I found that I went over things such as mobile addiction, uh, how distracting they are, how they limit your academic potential, how they distract you from job opportunities. I went over a lot of that and also how such as things like even cyberbullying and online dating, and I covered a lot of that in the research paper, and I really enjoyed actually writing this research paper. It felt like I was an actual scholar, how they write research papers, and it just was really cool seeing the final product and like something that I could actually be really proud of for this research. Advice and reflection, as I said before, this project has honestly changed me. I have grown so much from doing this project and also throughout BRVGS. I've met so many great people and how they've helped me grow and prepare me for college. And I don't think I would be the same without BRBGS. I think Ms. Johnston and all the staff have been a great help this entire time. And you guys are very lucky to have her. If any of you are going to BRBGS in the crowd, I'm sure most of you are. So this project has set me up for my future, honestly. And you honestly do get what you put in through this project. If the more effort you put in, the more you will get out. And just like as mentioned before, finding your passion, that was something I did. I knew I was passionate about psychology and mental health and self-improvement. 
So that just makes the whole process easier. But like I said, the more you put into this project, you will get something out of it and you will grow as a person and as a student. And this will prepare you for your next years after high school and to careers or ed further education. Uh, my future plans are to go to attend UVA next fall. I plan to major in computer science. And as I know that is different from psychology, but as I discussed with Dr. Sakara, computer science is can be heavily related to psychology and such as data processing and researching because there's a lot of statisticals, I mean statistics and things like statistical evidence that you need to analyze and computer science can help greatly with that. So she was very excited to hear that and she plans to reach out and possibly work together when I attend UVA. Uh, and that is all. Any other questions? Well, one of the biggest things would obviously be being on them less. So setting screen times or just consciously um, choosing not to pick up your phone in certain times where you need a productive, uh, to be productive. And I know that is very difficult and it takes a lot of effort since I assume most people are actually addicted to their cell phones, including myself and many people in this room. Unfortunately, that is just how the United States has developed. and just choosing not to use the phone when in a time of productivity is like one of the main ways to help. Most of my research was just analyzing the negatives and how it actually changes you psychologically. So that would be my personal advice to uh, uh, get away from those negatives. Any other questions? <laughs>